Sacramento Central Seventh Day Adventist Church. Thank you for joining us in Central Study Hour. We're so grateful that you're joining us to praise the Lord and learn the Word of God together. Let's sing our first hymn requested by Marion and Dick of the Netherlands. They requested him with title He Leadeth Me. Let's sing SDA hymnal number 537, verse 1, 3, and 4. from Netherlands. Thank you for this hymn request that you sent us. If you have a hymn request that you would like to share with us so we can sing together, please visit our website at sagcentral.org. Click contact us, then scroll down to CSH song request. Let us know your name, where are you from, and the title of the hymn. We'll be happy to sing your hymn request on the upcoming Sabbath. Uh, our second hymn, request comes from Andrew Schwartz of Texas, USA. Andrew re requested him with title, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Let's sing SDA hymnal number 538, verse, all verses 1, 2, 3.
Thank you, Andrew, for the hymn request that you sent us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for all your blessings that you have given to us, Lord. We're gathered here together to praise you and worship you. Please send your Holy Spirit to inspire us and guide us so that we understand your will. Please help, help us to be faithful, Lord, until your second coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Central Study Hour will be presented today by our pastor, Pastor Mike Thompson. And the lesson is number 11, Joseph, Master of the Dreams. I hope you have a blessed study. Well, I'd like to welcome you as well to uh, Central Study Hour today. And uh, we're on the theme of Genesis. We're on number 11 already. I say that just every week, but these quarters, they just fly by. So as usual, let me remind you, if you'd like a free CD or a DVD of today's presentation, you can contact us at 916-457-6511 or at uh, csh at saccentral.org and ask for offer number, write this down, offer number C22. 224, 22224. We'll repeat that at the end as well. And if you live in the continental United States, uh, then you can, uh, you can have a free copy. So uh, lesson number 11, Joseph, master of dreams. And uh, yes, he, he was very much involved uh, in dreams, having them and interpreting them. A uh, key verse is uh, Genesis 37, verse 19. This is from the New King James. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. That was Joseph's brother, and we'll get onto that little story uh, shortly. Uh, but let me read the introduction on Sabbath afternoon's page. Uh, the story of Joseph, and you notice it goes from chapters 37 through 50, so that's quite extensive. Uh, covers the last section of the book of Genesis from his first dreams in Canaan to his death uh, in Egypt. And you remember that the very last part there, he, he told them as he was getting ready to die, take my bones with you when you leave Egypt, but that's for another week. Uh, in fact, Joseph occupies more space in the book of Genesis than does any other patriarch. Although Joseph is just one of Jacob's sons, he is presented in Genesis as a great patriarch like Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. As we will see too, the life of Joseph highlights two important theological truths. Number one, God fulfills his promises. And that's true, is it not, Pam? Yes, it is. And second, God can turn evil into good. Amen. Romans 8, 28, if we believe that, all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So with that said, uh, it says in this week's study, we will focus on the early life of Joseph. He is Jacob's favorite son, which caused some problems, by the way. Uh, Jacob's favorite son, who ironically uh, is nicknamed the dreamer. And that was the memory verse. That's what his brothers called him. But the, the Hebrew actually means literally master of dreams, implying that he is an expert of dreams. This title fits him very well because he not only receives, understands, and interprets prophetic dreams, but he also, see, but he also fulfills them in his life as well. In these chapters, we will see again that God's providence is affirmed despite the evil and wickedness of the human heart. Uh, that's an amazing thing that, you know, people can do their worst, and they do, but yet God amazingly can turn things around. Uh, for, at least he can bring good uh, out of the evil. Okay, we're going to uh, Sunday, it's called Family Troubles, and we'll begin by reading uh, Genesis 37 verse one. It says, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land, in the land of Canaan. So, 
But it says in that first top paragraph, but as he was settling into the land, the troubles began. This time from his side, his family, it wasn't to do, it wasn't for Jacob uh, with the inhabitants, you know, digging a well or stealing a well or whatever else. Problem is this time it's inside his own family. Uh, and that can be the hardest to deal with. The controversy does not concern the possession of the land or that kind of stuff. But some of the controversy that takes place uh, is centered in sibling rivalry uh, between his older sons and, and the baby, at least at this point, Benjamin uh, hadn't arrived. You got, you got uh, Joseph, who's the baby, right? And so there's this terrible sibling rivalry takes place here in the relationship. And uh, there's a question there. It says, what family dynamic predisposed Joseph's brothers to hate him so much? Well, uh, let's go to Genesis 37. I'm going to read a few verses here. I want to read verses uh, 3, sorry, um, 3 through 11. Uh, I'd like to do that, verses 3 through 11. And it says, now Israel, that's uh, uh, Jacob, of course, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Well, right there, that did not, let me use a big word here, ingratiate him to his older brothers because uh, it was royalty that usually wore coats of many colors. And here's the baby boy and daddy who loves his baby boy, his daddy's boy, buys him his coat of many colors. Well, in their minds, that signified, and it turned out to be true, that signified that he, the youngest one, father was going to confer upon him the honors of the newborn. I mean, Judah, right? He was the firstborn. Sorry, the, I meant the firstborn. So that didn't set well right there. Uh, not just with Judah, but the rest of the, of the brothers. Verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him, that is, uh, Joseph, more than all his brethren, it says they, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So they just, they just hated him, never had a kind word for him. And I can imagine when daddy wasn't looking, they'd probably come by and slap the back of his head, you know, and just walk on. <laughs> See how it goes sometimes. I didn't have any brothers to do that to me. Neither did I have any sisters. So I guess I was the baby boy. That was the spoiled one. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, it, it just didn't help things. And then verse five, this didn't help either. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet more. Uh, no wonder when we read the dream here, verse five. And um, verse six, and he said unto them, here I pray you, big brothers, this dream which I have dreamed. And, he, and then he continues on and he, he explains the dream to them. My Bible's falling to pieces here. For behold, he said, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made abeyance to my sheaf. In other words, here's my sheaf, and all yours, they all bowed down <laughs> before my sheep. Now, what was the reaction with the brothers? And the brothers said to him in verse 8, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And what does it say for the third time? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Uh, I mean, he really put his foot in it, don't you think? You know, but he was daddy's boy and he hadn't matured yet. So he goes telling them about this, thinking they might be so thrilled, but actually they're not very thrilled at all. Uh, but then he tells, his, um, tells them another one, verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and, do, and told it to his brethren. Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And they probably rolled their eyes, but I guess they listened. And he says, and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. 
And uh, it doesn't say it here, but you can be sure they hated him the more. Verse 10, and he told it to his father and to his brethren, and, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren and indeed come and bow down ourselves to thee, uh, to the earth? So his father rebuked him, and he, he, he actually deserved that. Not for having the dream, that wasn't his fault, but I'm sure he was quite a little showy about the whole thing. But even though the father had rebuked him, it says in verse 11, uh, and his father envied him, but his father observed the saying. So this kind of stuck in Jacob's mind and he's wondering, I wonder if this means something here. So time, of course, would be the thing uh, that would tell. Uh, and then another thing that his brothers just loved him for, he was a snitch, right? And uh, verse, uh, chapter 37, verse 32, and um, uh, right at the end there, it says, uh, and Joseph brought unto his father evil reports about his big brothers. So it was just this little snitch, go tell his daddy. And that didn't set well either, as you, as you would imagine. So um, Jacob just fueled his brother's hatred and, and jealousy of him, uh, especially when he began relating the dreams, of course. And uh, binding the sheaves, uh, you, you find that there in, well, I just read it, didn't I? Uh, seven and eight, and then the sun and the moon and the stars. So Sunday's heading is family troubles, and things are just really brewing here for some major trouble to uh, come along in the family. Um, so let's go to Monday, the attack on Joseph. So here's where things really heat up a little bit here. The top paragraph, we read as follows. However horrible the events that were to follow, they're not hard to comprehend. To be in that close proximity to, and even to be related to, someone whom you hated would inevitably lead, sooner or later, only to trouble. Uh, and that's exactly what happens uh, in the second part, latter part of uh, Genesis chapter 37. Uh, and uh, we, we know the story well. All the big brothers are out looking after the sheep. And uh, Jacob, Israel, says to Joseph, uh, go, go find your, your brothers. Uh, they're out that direction and um, go and see how things are going. So uh, Joseph, he, he trots off and he goes to try and find his brothers and he can't find them. But he, he sees a man, there's a man, and he says, oh yeah, he knew who they were. He says, um, he said, they've gone. Um, I think it was to Dothan. So uh, he, he goes along and uh, lo and behold, um, he, um, he, he finds them. He, he locates where they are. And in verse 18, we note the brothers' reaction as they see uh, Jacob coming. So I'm going to read verses 18 through 24 in chapter 37. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. And you can imagine the sarcasm and the anger and the hatred in, the, in their voice. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say to our father, some evil beast has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it. And uh, so Reuben, you know, he, his heart wasn't in this. Uh, um, he obviously didn't like how his brother behaved. But there was no murder in his heart, at least. Uh, so he, he tries to think a way out of this whereby... He can spare his brother Joseph's life. Verse 21, and Reuben heard of it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And he comes up with a plan that looks like he's being just as mean. But uh, in verse 22, and Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness. 
and lay no hand upon him that he, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So his plan was, he told his brothers, let's throw him in here. In other words, to just stay here. And they probably thought, yeah, that'd be a terrible way to die. Just thirst, die of thirst. And yeah, okay, so they, yeah, it's fair enough. I didn't realize with Reuben, he was actually trying to engineer things where he could actually get his brother out, you see. Um, but anyway, so he could take him back to his father. And it came to pass when Joseph was come into his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So here he is. It looks like, um, you know, it looks humanly like he's, he's, he's doomed. Um, let me pick up here on, on the lesson here. Sorry. Have you ever heard the saying, right? Vengeance is sweet. Uh, revenge is sweet. Do you find that in the Bible? No. It's a very satanic and very humanistic uh, proverb. Revenge is sweet. You got your own back and your enemy and you... you you know, you, whether they've cut you off on the freeway and you get in front of them, you know, near the split, that, that's the mild form of it. Or whether you actually uh, want to take their lives. That vengeance is sweet just to get your own back. Um, and, the, you know, to the devil, vengeance is sweet. But when the Holy Spirit is working on somebody's heart, even though they may have been offended and their worst passions aroused, the Holy Spirit can bring self-control and the Holy Spirit can quell those desires to get even and get revenge. And obviously the Holy Spirit was working on Reuben's heart. Let, let's, not, let's not do that. But anyway, revenge isn't always sweet. And it says this in the lesson, in the one, two, fourth paragraph down. But some of them, not just Reuben, but some of the brothers were ill at ease. They did not feel the satisfaction they had anticipated from their revenge. So, uh, you know, it's not necessarily sweet. But it says, this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 211. Uh, it says, um, soon, however, a company of travelers was seen approaching. It was a caravan of Ishmaelites from beyond Jordan on their way to Egypt with spices and other merchandise. Judah now proposed to sell their brother to these heathen traders instead of leaving him to die. So even he, you know, he just didn't want to see him perish like that. While, so he didn't want to see him die, but at the same time he would be effectually put out of their way and they would remain clear of his blood, but it was still a sin, wasn't it? We won't take his blood, we won't take his life, but we're still gonna sin in this respect, and uh, sin is sin. It says there afterwards, after they cast him into the pits, planning to kill him later, oh, I just read this, a, a caravan, a caravan came by and they sold him and took him down to Egypt. Um, who would have dreamed seeing what seemed to be the end of this uh, daddy's boy, the end of their brother, they'd never hear from him again. Who would have ever dreamed what would be the result of this just total calamity? But you see, God has ways, and this is part of the lesson here, and we read it in the introduction, God has the most incredible ways of bringing good out of evil. And here's a prime example coming up here. And we're going to see that same principle at work. Uh, we see it at work even now in various ways. I uh, don't want to get off track, but uh, my wife was telling me that at Amazing Facts, there was um, a gentleman speaking um, yesterday uh, and he was from an African country. I'm sorry, I don't remember where. Uganda? Yeah, Uganda, yeah. And he was a uh, member of the Tutu tribe. 
And uh, there was genocide going on. This was a few years ago, you may remember this. And uh, the Tutus in Uganda, they were being slaughtered. And uh, this gentleman, he was, he was a minister, he was a seminary Adventist, he was trying to get his way out of the country. And uh, he actually carried his card, his ID card, which said he was a Tutu. And uh, there were several checkpoints along the way and um, he's praying all the time, he pulls his card out and sometimes the, the guard would get distracted and just wave him through so he gets through a checkpoint. And there was another checkpoint where the guard really says, uh, you're a tutu? Uh, like, what are you doing here? You're a tutu. He says, you're a tutu? He says, yes. He says, Go that way. So, you know, there's all these things. Did you see it live? Yeah. Yeah, I got it secondhand. Yeah, go that way. And at one point, there were two guards in another place wrestling over him. There was one uh, guard at one checkpoint, he had a machete and he was dispatching people. And this gentleman, the pastor, he was in line to go down here and he was just kind of stuck there. But then um, another guard came along and he said, and he showed him, he said, and he pulled him out of line. But next thing, another guard came and he's trying to pull him back into line. Anyway, the stronger one won. And again, he got free. And as Helen was telling me that, I said, I wonder if there were both an angel of God in human form and an angel of the devil in human form. But uh, if that was so, then the angel of the Lord won. Oh, the strongest man among the two <laughs> won. God can do this thing. It's just, it's just incredible. Yeah, it, it really, really is. Uh, so why am I saying that? Um, we've done Monday. Oh, yes. There, there's a question at the bottom of the page here. Um, why Monday, bottom of the page. Why is it so important to seek God's power in order to change bad traits of character before they can manifest themselves in acts that at one point in your life, you would never have imagined yourself doing. Why is it important for God's power to change you before you reach that point? It's really a, a straightforward principle that we see in the experience of Lucifer. The covering cherub stood right by the throne of God and yet it was standing there, seeing the glory of God on an ongoing basis that he first started to entertain those inflated ideas about himself. And it was right there where the rebellion took place. Now, if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, um, I think it's the first chapter of the introduction, uh, the servant of the Lord says there that God knew what was going on. And God took Lucifer aside and he spoke to him and he explained to him what was going on inside. He said, I'm, I'm using my own words here. He says, Lucifer, you don't see what, where your feet are tending, but I can see. And I, I'm telling you, son, you need to surrender to this. I can help you. You need to get rid of it. You need to turn around and you still can. And the servant of the Lord says, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong and he was about ready to turn around, but pride forbade him. So you see this angel was a mighty angel, so exalted above every other angel. And yet now he is the most debased creature that God ever created. From there to there, because of that principle, if we leave sin unchecked, it will take us down, 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 down. Further, than at this point we could ever dream possible. But Lucifer's life history is there as a lesson for us as well. Judas, he was another one. In Desire of Ages, a chapter there on Judas. It was with Jesus three and a half years. When he first joined Jesus, Ellen White says that he would never have dreamed of selling his master for 30 pieces of silver, but just in those three, three and a half years, that's all it took in his case for him to, because he, he cherished uh, covetousness and greed. Just in that short space of time, it was all he needed to take him down to sell his master for 30 pieces of silver. So there's a lesson there for all of us, isn't there? So the remedy is, what is it? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 
If any man, if any woman be in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We need Jesus inside. We need to be in Christ. And if you want to know what it means to be in Christ, go to John, 1 John, uh, 1 John 4, 12, I think it is. And it speaks there being in Christ, receiving the Holy Spirit. You've got the Holy Spirit inside you. You are in Christ Jesus. Uh, let's move on to Tuesday. Uh, Judah and Tamar, this chapter here, verse chapter 38, kind of jumps up. You got, we're beginning this history here of Joseph and then suddenly we, we break. We've got a whole chapter and it's dealing with something totally different. But yet, chronologically, it's, it's still in line, though uh, Joseph isn't mentioned here. Well, we've got the story of, of, of uh, sorry, Judah. And um, he, he's left home. Uh, this follows the incident where Joseph is taking, is on his way down to uh, Egypt or has just arrived. But uh, here we've got, uh, well, let me read the top paragraph. The story of Tamar, Judah and Tamar, is not out of place here. This incident, this incident follows chronologically the sale of Joseph in, in, in Egypt. It is consistent with the fact that Judah had just left his brothers, which points to his disagreement with them. In addition, the text shares a number of common words and motifs, which the preceding chapter, sorry, I get tongue-tied, let me read that again, shares a number of common words and motifs which the with the preceding chapter, and it carries the same theological lesson, an evil act will be turned into a positive event linked to salvation. And this does as well, although it doesn't, appear so on, on, on the surface. So anyway, so you've got Judah and uh, he gets married and he has, um, he has three sons. He's got one called Er, Onan, and uh, kind of pronounced a bit like Sheila or Shilah maybe. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but he's got these three boys. Anyway, the first son he marries to Tamar uh, this uh, young lady here, she's a Canaanite. And um, yeah, yeah uh, he marries uh, the first boy uh, to, um, to um, Tamar. But Er and his brother Onan, they're wicked. And it tells us there in chapter uh, 38 that God slew both of them. First the older one, then the middle one. And so now Tamar, she's, uh, she's a widow. She doesn't have a husband. And uh, Sheila, he's just a little boy. So Judah promises her, he says, uh, look, he says, um, just, just hold on, when Sheila uh, is older, you can have him as a husband. I don't know if you'd be interested in marrying uh, a young boy that may be 20 years younger than you, ladies. But anyway, that's a different story. But anyway, so it, it was the principle, you see, that she would have a husband. Uh, so anyway, uh, he, Sheila's, takes his while growing, of course, but he must be getting up there. But on top of that, um, uh, Judah is slow keeping his word. And so uh, Tamar decides that she's got, to, uh, she's got to do something about this. And in the third paragraph down, it says, when after some time Judas seemed to have forgotten his promise, as he goes on to come, as he goes to comfort himself after, his wife died as well, by the way. Uh, Tamar decides to play the prostitute in order to force him to fulfill his promise. And you know the story there. Um, He's, uh, he's going along and there's this woman and what Tamar does, she puts a veil over her face, which was the custom and she's sitting by the roadside and very obviously, you know, she, um, she was for sale. So um, he uh, approaches her and um, makes the proposition, but he has no cash, there's no money. So uh, she asks for a pledge. So he says, I'll give you, I'll give you a kid from, from the goats doesn't have that at that moment. So he gives her his staff and his ring and um, his bracelets and, uh, and that'll do for now. That's, that's, that's the pledge. Um, anyway, you know the story. Um, 
she becomes pregnant. And um, nobody knows about this. Jacob's gone on his way and she's gone on her way. But then it's found out that Tamar has played, played the prostitute and she's pregnant. And, uh, well, Judah, he's up in arms. That this woman that I had once married off to one of my sons has brought shame and disgrace upon my family. She's pregnant. Well, you know what she did, don't you? There was obviously witnesses there. And uh, she says, she says, these belong to the men who has made me pregnant. And who do they belong to? Judah. And he can't do a thing about it. But I'll give him this. He did admit, I told her, he says, well, you are much more righteous uh, than I am. It must have been a terrible humiliation for him, but he deserved it, didn't he? One, two, three, fifth paragraph. The conclusion of this sordid story, and, and this is where the good comes out of it. The conclusion of this sordid story is the birth of Perez, meaning breaking through, who like Jacob is born second and becomes first and is named in salvation history as the ancestor of who? David. David. You read that in Ruth. And ultimately of Jesus Christ. So praise the Lord, he, he was born out of, a, of adultery, which is nothing much to boast about, but yet at the same time, there's some of his DNA in the Messiah when he comes. Uh, this is why uh, Jesus' uh, forebears, they didn't always shine so bright, did they? You know, they were as human as human could be. And it all helps you understand the, what kind of nature Jesus had. He came with a nature like our Romans 8.3. Had a fallen nature. Didn't mean he sinned. Not for a moment. He didn't sin. But when he was born, he took on him. And in his DNA, the, the same weaknesses and liabilities that we have. In his DNA was all the raw ingredients whereby Jesus could have sinned. But he didn't. Hebrews 4, it says he was in all points tempted like as we are. So nonetheless, ultimately uh, Christ would come. It says, as for Tamar, she is the first of the four women, followed by Rahab, who was a prostitute, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah, who genealogically preceded Mary, the mother of Jesus. Isn't it amazing how God works things out? So it says, one lesson we can take from this story, just as God's, God saved Tamar through his grace, transforming evil into good, so will he save his people through the cross of Jesus. And in the case of Joseph, he will turn his troubles into the salvation of Jacob and his sons. Praise God. God's patient and long-suffering, isn't he? He's had many frustrations and still does. Okay, let's go on to Wednesday. Joseph, a slave in Egypt. So he's been sold. So we moved on now from 38 and we pick up again now on this uh, story of Joseph. Top paragraph, Wednesday. We now pick up the flow of Joseph's stories which have been interrupted by the Tamar incident. Joseph is now working as a slave for the captain of the guard, Potiphar, who is in charge of the prison for royal officials. Uh, so there, there he is. Um, and there's a question there, right underneath in bold. In light of the example of Joseph's working as a manager under Potiphar, what are the factors that led to his success? Well, I want us to go to chapter 39. Chapter 9, verses 2, 3, and 4. Chapter 1, it says he was... Uh, brought down to Egypt by the Ismailites and sold to Potiphar. Verse two, and the Lord was with Joseph and he was, pros he was a prosperous man, not with his own money, he didn't have a penny, but nonetheless, God prospered him. That's what it means. And um, he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. 
And then in verse three, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. So in verse two, it says the Lord was with him and prospered him. And in verse three, it says his master saw that the Lord was with him. And his master also saw that the Lord prospered him. The Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Potiphar was very pleased with this slave that he had bought. Not that slavery is, slavery, slavery is right, of course. Uh, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and I should hope so. And he served him, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. Now, if we put that in, um, in, in a contemporary setting, um, you might say that Potiphar said to Joseph, you know, I'm going to give you everything. This is my social security number. Gave him that. Uh, here's my credit cards. Gave him his credit cards. He says, let's go down to the bank. I want to make you a signatory on my bank account, my bank accounts. So if you like, that's, that's what he did. But he trusted him so much. There was obviously not just the fact that God prospered Joseph as his managing thing. He was a good manager and part of us saw that. But there was obviously something in the character of Joseph that must have shone out, that made this heathen, idolater think, this is a fine young man. He's, if this is what his God is like, it, it was a witness. It was a witness. You know, after the, after the downfall of uh, what happened to uh, Joseph, we don't hear any more about Potiphar and his wife. But we don't know the conclusion of Potiphar's history. Who knows? He may there be on the sea of glass. We have no idea. We have no idea. Okay, so uh, he, he puts him in charge of, of everything. Uh, I'm reading here now the um, second paragraph. It says, Joseph's, Joseph's success, however, did not corrupt him. Didn't go to his head. He didn't see an opportunity of, um, well, here's nine, whatever, they had for, here's nine Egyptian dollars for Potiphar and one for me. He could have probably have done that because he was trusted with the books. But uh, it didn't corrupt him. But what about this other aspect here? Potiphar had a wife, you see. Um, let's pick up on verse, uh, chapter 39, 7 through 9. And um, let's see what, because this was a different test. This was not money, this was something else. And it says here, uh, verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, um, Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph. And uh, she so just told him up front, uh, lie with me. So she propositioned him. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master... Um, has trusted me with everything in his house. He has committed everything that he has to my hand. Uh, there is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee. He's given me everything, but you're his wife, and he has not given me to you. And what's more, I don't want you. You're his wife. And he says there, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God. Amen. Say amen to that, can I? How many a young man his age, early 20s, like Daniel, they go down and they're, they're mixing with royalty, if you will, and the high ups in the social circles and given high positions and there's all these allurements in Egypt and also in Babylon with Daniel and yet they maintain their integrity. What a testimony to what God can do in the life of a human being, of a young man, where there's things there just for the asking. But praise God, uh, he didn't do what, um, what he was given the opportunity uh, to do. So the Lord was with him. And so this woman, she propositioned him a few times if you read the, if you read the, the context but she probably felt slighted and insulted 
And so instead of this desire for him, this spite arose inside. And so you know the story. She called the uh, servants. She, she took his robe off him. Look, he left this with me. He tried to uh, sexually assault me. And so the servants know about it. Husband comes home. She tells him as well, and he's angry. And Joseph, well, as you know, he's, um, he's thrown into prison. Uh, too bad. But yet in all of this, as we read through it, um, never once does Joseph become bitter. He maintains his hope, retained his confidence in God, and uh, we'll see how God next gives the, the chief of the prison, if he was in the jail, it would be the commander, uh, gives the commander of the jail it gives Joseph grace in his sight as, uh, as well. So I'm going to have to move on here to chapter 39, verses 21 through 23. 39, 21 through 23. So he goes in jail, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, and the Lord made it prosper. Amazing. My wife Helen has a favorite book. It's called God Sent a Man. It's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's um, written by Carlisle B. Haynes. He's long deceased now. It's out of, books out of print, but once in a while it comes back in. God sent a man. It's about this thick. Uh, if you Google it, anybody who's listening in, and you might want to copy, I'm sure there's some used ones out there on eBay and the like, but it's a really good story about Joseph's character. God sent a man. Very, very, very well written. Um, yeah, just uh, really well done. All right, let's go to Thursday. The dreams of Pharaoh here, reading the top paragraph. The providential character of the events continues. Over time, Joseph is put in charge of the prisoners, two of whom happen to be former officers of Pharaoh, a butler and a baker. They are both troubled by dreams that they cannot understand because there is no interpreter. Well, little do they know there is one right there in the prison. So uh, Joseph, uh, he interprets uh, their dreams res uh, respectively. Let's go to 40 verses 9 through 11. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him in his dream, Behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and a blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And so Joseph now, he gives in the interpretation. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand as the former manner when you were his butler. And, but he says, what did he tell him? He says, but think about me. You know, re remember me to Pharaoh when you get out. Well, did he do that? Not right away, you know, a couple of years at least. But uh, anyway, so that, that was his dream and that was the interpretation. And then uh, we get the baker uh, verses 16 and 17, and um, kind of quake here, but anyway. Uh, when the chief baker saw the interpretation was good, he sent, said unto Joseph, I also was in my, in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets in my head, on my head, and the uppermost basket there, there was full of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. There was Pharaoh's chocolate chip cookies, if you will, and all the things that uh, Pharaoh loved. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, I, I would imagine Joseph probably was a little quiet 
for a little while wondering, how, how do I explain this to this baker here? Uh, the Bible writes it just pretty matter of fact, but uh, it must have been difficult. But anyway, uh, Joseph said, um, verse 18, the, the three baskets are also three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up your head from off you and uh, he, he's going to hang you on a tree and the birds shall eat your flesh. Well, um, Joseph, I'm sure, I had a sensitive heart. It must have been difficult. I don't know how this man felt. I have no idea. But uh, maybe before his life ended, maybe he asked Joseph, tell me about your God. Is your God merciful? We may see him in heaven. I'd like to think so. Would you not as well? Um, so anyway, so much for the dreams. Then in a parallel way, parallel situation, then Pharaoh, uh, he also has dreams. And you know the story well. There's the, uh, there's the seven cows, uh, the fat ones and the thin ones, and the thin ones eat up the fat ones, and the thin ones are no fatter. And then there's the, uh, the seven ears of, of corn, fat ones, and seven blighted ones, and the seven blighted ones eat the seven fat ones, and the, the thin ones are still just as blighted. They're just, so it looks just like a mess here. But nonetheless, Joseph comes in and he explains to Pharaoh all that this means, says there's gonna be seven years of famine. So you need to get the, gather all the grain you can in, sorry, not seven years of famine, seven years of plenty, gather in all you can for the seven years of famine. Long story short, this boy who was sold into slavery, Pharaoh uh, accepts the interpretation of the dream, is very impressed by it, knows it's from God, puts Joseph in charge of it, you're the prime minister, go to it. What an end Amen. to this part of Joseph's experience. Who would have believed it? So what was our theme? Yeah, Joseph the dreamer, but how God can bring good out of evil, and he did in this instance as well, didn't he? Praise God. I'll have to leave it there. Um, we're rushing the last part a little bit, but we have to conclude here. So I just want to remind you, um, those of you who are looking in today, uh, you can have a free CD or a free DVD of today's presentation. And if you ask for offer number C, remember this, two, two, Two two four C two 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 four, and call us at nine one six four five seven six five one one, or email us at csh at sexcentral org. You can have a free copy, CD or a DVD of today's uh, lesson. So, with that said, we're so glad that you could join us today, and uh, join us next week. We'll be on lesson number twelve in the book of Genesis. Uh, time flies, does it not, Pim? And we'll see what happens there in the life of Joseph. So again, God bless, and uh, by the grace of God, we'll see you next week, same time, same place. Thank you.